We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Today, from Israel, we have David Nekretman. I tried. Did I say it right? You said it correctly, and you could call me Brother David. You could just call me David or Al, according to the song. Matter. Oh, Paul Simon's song. You can call me Al. I, I know it well. Thank you. Uh, David, as we uh, uh, get started, I, I must note that you said uh, that you can't promise that there won't be sirens going on in the background. That brings a very vivid way of thinking about the world in which we live and how small it is for us to be joined together here in one place uh, while thousands of miles away. But before we get into the things that you've been working on, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your education, your career, and that sort of thing. A uh, father of three boys, a uh, 24-year-old, a uh, 21-year-old, and a 17-year-old. Um, my wife my wife is actually a second-generation Israeli. Her came over from Yemen during Operation Eagle's Wings in 1949, and they pioneered what is called a Moshav, an agricultural community, uh, not in not far from Netanya, which is not is close by to Caesarea. And uh, so I met my wife. Well, it's about twenty, almost twenty-eight years ago. Okay. Uh, so everything is great. Uh, the marriage and and. Being back into Israel, I made my move about 19 years ago. I'm the first of my family to return back home after 2,000 years. I did this because I wanted my children to grow up with a sense of being Jewish is something to be proud of and not to be weighed down as a responsibility of burden to live in the diaspora. So you could be whoever you wish to be in Israel, understanding that being Jewish is just like breathing. And also, when we're talking about education, unlike the United States until recently, that you can't, you have a separation of church and state where tax dollars was not able to go to religious education, we have a fusion of synagogue and state where we can use our tax shekels to pay for religious education that represents your values. So that is the primary reason when my oldest was five years old that we decided to make our move here. Yeah. Now, and uh, about for 23 years, I've dedicated my life to the reconciliation, the rapprochement between Jews and Christians, because I believe fully that I can't be who I am as a Jew, stewarding this land under his covenant and kingdom without our covenantal partners. And I don't know any other faith community that understands the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that ha understands scripture as divine, like my Christian brothers and sisters. And be, through this journey, I had the honor of attending Oral Roberts University with a master's in biblical literature. And uh, I, for my work in Jewish Christian relations, it's been recognized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is a uh, religious department. They give me the honor as an ambassador for Jewish Christian relations to the world. And recently, I think most people are more excited that I'm a Jewish advisor to the chosen. Yeah. But I can't give away any secrets to yeah. season five. Okay, so I'm just letting you know I signed well, an NDA. Let, let me clarify one thing for our audience, uh, because it wasn't clear to me as I researched, and you made it clear as we uh, talked before the uh, this interview. But you remain Jewish. You are not Christian. You are not. You do not call yourself a Christian, but you are committed to conciliatory efforts between Jews and Christians. And you're also committed to helping Christians understand the nature of the Jewish nature of their faith in, in a historic sense. Is that well put? Is that, is that, that is well put. I want, I'll even go further with the verbiage. I want Christians to be Christ centered and that identity of who Jesus is for a Christian is also to take in consideration that he was born in a Jewish home, he was raised with a Jewish education, and he spoke Jewish ease, and the disciples 
we're Jewish. It's Jews speaking to Jews. So it might be helpful to understand for a Christian making their journey with God to understand the high definition of Jesus's background. And for years, I've been, you know, Utilize, utilizing this platform and understanding the Hebraic roots of Christianity to make the reconciliation between our faith communities, celebrating the differences, but then addressing what the commonalities are and further expanding that. Because I think there's a thin line between Jews and Christians in their walk with God, and that thin line of the differences will ultimately be reconciled when Messiah comes. Okay. And God will work out the details on yeah. that. But until that happens, there's a partnership of that we need to work together. So I'm one of the Jews who works on this relationship from a relational model, not from a relationship of convenience or crisis. Yeah, I, that, that I understand. Let's um, let's keep on that uh, topic for just a moment. Um, as a Christian who believes, as I do, that Jesus is a uh, son in the Trinitarian God of Christianity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus of Nazareth was Jesus the Messiah and made some exclusive claims that people don't relate to him except, excuse me, don't come to being reconciled uh, to God uh, with regard to the need for reconciliation due to me, man, uh, in general, and me in particular being a sinner, that those are things that uh, are unique to Christianity, um, and they have deep theological implications, but there is enormous need for me as a Christian to understand my roots back into uh, Judaism because it's out of Judaism that Jesus comes. How do you deal with those things as you seek to bring reconciliation between Jews and Christians? How does how does oh. how do those things play out? Because they in, at a sense, they are incompatible and have to be understood as an agreement to disagree at some level from my vantage point. 100%. I do think at the end of the day, there's going to be some disagreements, but I do ask for grace from a Christian to recognize Paul's uh, Romans chapter 11 outline. I don't see what you see. So let's accept the veil that I have so you can come into this covenantal experience with God. So if you can accept this mystery that Paul writes in Romans 11, where I have a veil at the end of the day. That's what you believe. So can you accept that veil and still walk with me? And I believe you can, because sort of that's the nature of grace to begin with, that although we are different in the way we express our faith in God and the theological implications for that, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's no responsibility that both faith commun communities to be working together. The divide shouldn't be we're in separate corners because if we are truly to be his agents on the earth to bring the kingdom of heaven down here, then I believe that could be done working together as opposed to certain times in church history where it was a duel to the death for us, at least on, on our side when it came to Jews and the church itself. I don't put the entire church history on the individual Christian that I meet today who has a heart for Israel and the Jewish people. I think that's that's not fair. And many Christians come to faith. Uh, all of a sudden, they are, have this awakening or calling when it comes to learning about the Hebraic roots or maybe have some type of heart for Israel and Jewish people. So I am not judge and jury. I have to take this relationship in front of me, nurture it, enhance it and actually have that mystery because it's also a mystery for us as Jews, because although um, the church has spread out to the four corners of the world, when that happened, we weren't able to do our own mission the same way anymore because often what happened was Jews were put into very precarious situations throughout church history, uh, ending up in ghettos, uh, pogroms, and so on and so forth. So 
what the mystery is on our side is um, there seemed to be a divorce, not only from the Jewish roots of Christianity, but an active um, call to actually hurt Jesus's family. So that is a mystery on my side that I have to grapple with when working with Christians, because Jews live in memory. We don't live in, in history. In fact, there is no biblical word for history. Okay? You will never, it, it actually, the modern day Hebrew calls it historia. That is our accented way to talk about history because we live in something called memory, which is represented by the Hebrew word zecher, which really means a past episode lived in the present moment for the future of God and your people. And yeah. because that memory includes very negative episodes with the church, it's hard for many Jews to get out of their comfort zone to make a reconciliation effort with Christians who have a heart for the Jewish people and Israel. So, so I've been very be fortunate. Your, your motivation on the side of your people, the Jewish community, to say, hey, we need to be able to get beyond this to relate to these people who are willing to, if we're willing to relate to them. Correct. I Again, I want you to believe Jesus is divine and savior. All right. I'm saying this. I want you to believe that because if you do truly have a Christ center approach to your faith, I really don't have anything to worry about. But when it, it becomes exclusively the social gospel or exclusively the prosperity gospel, I get a little worried. Oh, I would so, do it if I were you. And I do it for me too. <laughs> So and, and anyway, that's not the compass of where Christianity is supposed to be in exclusively. There's a combination of faith and how that faith is being actualized into the world. Uh, so for me, I believe there is enough in the hands of God for both of our communities to finally have this long overdue discussion, but more importantly, to cooperate with one another so we can do the kingdom work for God together. What um, are the people that are listening to this are likely to be uh, almost entirely a Christian audience. That's who we serve. What are the things that we need to learn to enhance our faith from a historical standpoint or from a memory standpoint uh, for that that really help us understand better the roots from which Christianity comes. So remember, we're in a geographic location. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from that geographic location. So Jesus wasn't born in Rome. Jesus was born in Israel. He was born in a Jewish family. Yeah. When he's speaking parables and teachings, a third of just let's deal with a third of Jesus's teachings is all in parables. Well, where did Jesus get the story format of a parable? Well, it's part of his upbringing. There is something called the book of Proverbs, which is these one liners of parables. They're really parables. The book of Proverbs in Hebrew is called Mishle, where the Hebrew word, uh, the root word for that is Mashal, which is parable. But the story format, of a parable begins when David is being rebuked by Nathan through a story format parable. It's a teaching, right? And if you truly do a deep dive into parables, it's always about asking the listener to do an immediate action. That's why you see David, when he finally gets the aha moment that it's him being talked about in the parable, he goes into repentance mode. There's, a, there's an immediate action. So Jesus, because he knows the story, when he's talking to his own disciples and people around him and uses parables, it's not just a teaching moment, it's an action moment. It's, it's almost as Nike borrowed their slogan, just do it, from the parable moments that happen in the Bible. Because that's basically it. Because if you look at... Anything that's going on, the reason why he's bringing the parable is for the listener to make a decision. Sometimes the decision is not to Jesus' liking. Some people walk away. Some right. people actually say yes. So for me, 
if you don't have the Hebraic lens to some of the teachings of Jesus, sometimes the person who's studying it may lose out in the fullness of the revelation yeah. of what's going on. Yeah. So having a Hebraic background is very important. And the art of the question is all part of how Jesus operates, which is very much a Jewish way of learning. Often in schools, you have a Greek way of learning, but a Jewish way of learning is really questions. You have 300 questions in the gospels, but only three answers. Uh, so isn't the question more important than necessarily the immediate need for an answer? And that's what I learned when I studied the gospels. Like this is a very, very much a Jewish way of teaching. And so it resonated with me. But often, because we live in American society and everything is instantaneous and we need the instantaneous gratification, uh, going through the process of a good question is often ignored in education. Yeah. Uh, so you're yeah. not supposed to spoon feed right. every, your students. You're supposed to get them to the point of asking, why is this happening? What's going on? So you... What you are referring to also brings to mind the idea of a Socratic approach to learning. Would you consider those uh, quite parallel, quite similar? Yes and no. So again, Hebraic thinking is not always linear in its approach. Okay. Uh, you Because we can remember, when you're looking at the Bible, the Bible is pretty much a hyperlink. You can go to different places. Right. Uh, although I, pre I appreciate Calvary Chapel's approach to the Bible, learning verse by verse, going from Genesis all the way to Revelation, uh, the way uh, that Jews approach it is very much from a macro approach because of the hyperlinks. Language that is used in one book can be very important to help us understand context and actually interpretation and translation for another book. So it's important to understand the hyperlinks. Therefore, linear approach alone doesn't necessarily work in a uh, Hebraic deep dive in excavating sacred text. And sometimes you have to go off the little bit on the tangents to get back to what the revelation on Luggett is from the text. Okay. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, I, uh, you are easily the most articulate Orthodox Jew on the New Testament that I've ever spoken to. And I'm fascinated to hear uh, that perspective. We've, you know, as classical Christian educators, we have really come to embrace uh, the need to understand context and that sort of thing. So when Paul is um, preaching on Mars Hill, the context of what Mars Hill was to the culture is significant, but you take this in a much broader and deeper way by saying, uh, Christian, you, you will benefit a lot from understanding the historic context from which your Christian faith comes. Yeah, I'll even go, let's just do a, a quick deep dive for a second, because when we talk about the woman who is experiencing a heavy blood flow for a number of years, and she's rushing into the crowd, all she wants to do uh, well, in most translations, is touch the hem of Jesus's coat, right? And there's the famous gospel song on that in the 1940s, and uh, where Sam Cooke is singing that when he was part of the Soul Stirrers. So it's not the hem of Jesus's coat. It's actually the tassels or fringes, or in Hebrew, we call tzitzit, that Jews wore as part of their garb in their expression of their faith to him as as outlined in the book of numbers right so why is the woman wanting to touch the tzitzit the tassels what why is that so important for her why why that particular thing so once you ask the question because matthew's version of it is the shortest and sweetest of it, it does it's it's just straight to the point she had an issue. She had a disease. She's looking for a remedy. There's no remedy. She sees the remedy in Jesus. And all of a sudden, she figures that the way to do this is to touch his tassel. And then Jesus tells her, and he, he's not saying he healed her. It's her faith healed her. So what does faith have to do with these funny-looking strings that you see? 
And the answer is you have to go back to the book of numbers, but the, the book of numbers is a weird book. It's a hodgepodge of stories it and is laws. It's very hard for me as a Christian to understand numbers. Yeah, it is because it's a hodgepodge. It's not, it doesn't work out as a law book. It has stories. So the story of the 10 spies is very important to the introduction of the fringes mandate that's given to the Jewish people. Now, I don't call the 10 spies because A, uh, you can't say anything is a, on a recon mission if you're telling the public about it. If you're selecting people who are heads of this, who have no training in spy work whatsoever, right? And you're bringing back large amounts of fruit that are pretty big. So like you're asking customs to beg you to ask you the questions, what are you doing? So nothing of this smells of spies. And in fact, I call this the 10, 10 trip advisor reviewers <laughs> episode because it's really there. Moses is trying to accomplish a PR win. The people are low in their morale. He wants people to get excited. They're going into Israel. So he figures he'll do this PR thing of getting the heads of the of the tribes to go into Israel, come back with a great report. Everyone is pumped up. We're ready to go in. And unfortunately, they gave a bad review. Ten of these people get a bad review on TripAdvisor. And, and then what happens? So much happens in this moment where they lose their faith to such a degree they want to replace Moses. And that is the nail in the coffin for the generation that saw open revelation and went through all these miracles, lost their faith in a moment because of bad for a bad trip advisor review, and they get killed out in the desert. Okay, but it comes down to faith. Right after that story, you have the introduction of the fringes on a four corner garment that you're supposed to wear, and it's about faith. It's about making sure that you don't deviate from what God wants walk for him so now we can understand why this woman who's so desperate for a remedy who technically should have given up on her life because she didn't see any any remedy whatsoever from a from a physical world point of view but she remembered something about her history yeah. and she figured if i could touch the fringes of jesus that might be the key so with the background of understanding numbers properly from a macro approach, it helps then to see the story, even from a Matthew point of view, which is the shortest, in a new light. And it comes out, now you can understand Jesus' uh, response, finally. It's your faith that healed you yeah. because she remembered her ancestors. So that makes sense. This is like a like a real deep dive in a, in a few minutes. Yeah, it is. In, in all of what you're doing, what I see is an attempt to bring you know, to educate Christians about Judaism to help them understand their faith better. I get that. I think that's very important. But what does success look like for you beyond that? What do you hope to accomplish in 20 years? Uh, you will have been involved in this more than 40 years. And you look back, what will you hope to have had happen as a result of your work? So I've been very fortunate that many pastors that I brought to Israel or I have a relationship when I go around the world and I speak, that they have a heart for, for the Jewish people, for the relationship in and of itself. So I've already, like, if God took me now, I'm really content because I search something that is truly higher than me. I move the kingdom of God just a little bit in the reconciliation between both of our faith communities. But my new chapter in the last couple of years is really to go into Bible education in the Christian world. And my hope is that by fusing critical thinking skills with Hebraic thought, that this may be a key for teenagers that are learning the Bible, get an appreciation of the sacred text in a more profound way that they're walking with this, and we don't. I don't have to hear the Barner research statistic anymore. The ninety percent of teenagers that grow up in Christian homes leave their faith. I don't want Christian teenagers to walk away from their faith. A, you have an amazing faith, B, 
but B, that maybe the way that we're teaching the Bible can be done a little differently by providing the the developing of the muscle of critical thinking skills through the Bible. Because often what happens in Christian education with critical thinking skills is you're buying secular books to help you on develop that muscle. And I'm like, wait a second, you're only spending like four years, you know, with the secular book. Why don't I use the one that will be with me eternally? And that's yeah. the Bible, right? Yeah. So when, when God takes us up to heaven, you know, what are we doing all day? We're learning his word. We're basking in the light, but we're learning his word. Well, do you have an elementary approach to that? Or do you have a more sophisticated approach? And maybe we have a more sophisticated approach. A win for me is that many Christian students do a deeper dive than mostly what happens in Christian education is a devotional approach to scripture. We're reading chapters and verses. You got the highlights and then you do a worship and you pray. Very important, but you can't expect someone who's going through their teenage years and developing their mind to use the old school method for that age. So it, as long as God has me on earth, for me, my, my mission now, based upon Christian mothers and grandmothers asking me to step out from my previous leadership role and to go into this educational calling uh, and uh, for me, as I said, if if Christians can, especially Christian teenagers, can recognize that Jesus is Jewish for them, and that the text is profound, but you, but many people just don't know how to dissect it in a way that will resonate more than just how I'm feeling about the text, as opposed to <laughs> what is the text really saying, yeah, and yeah. what can I learn from that in my walk with God? Yeah, yeah. Well, God is an eminently logical God, and logic is a discipline uh, that can be studied and understood, and it's a critical element within classical Christian education uh, and and uh, uh, contributes to what you're talking about as well. In the last few minutes, I have to ask you, tell us about your work on The Chosen and uh, tell us what you're allowed to tell us. I understand you can't reveal any secrets. You made that clear. <laughs> Correct. So, uh, I first of all, I want to say to the to the chosen leadership, uh, it's amazing that they're willing to hear from an Orthodox Jewish voice. I think uh, you have Jason. You have uh, you have a few people within the Messianic world that become commentators with the chosen, and that's important. But for the chosen to open up their willingness their doors for us to give them advice on the following. This is how we determine our role. We, I had Dr. Phaedra Shapiro, uh, who's, who's a female Orthodox theologian that lives in Israel as well. Uh, we came to the determination, this is our way of helping the chosen. What is being presented in the script? Is that authentically what was said and practiced in Second Temple Judaism? Judaism, so I would say with a plural. So let me give you an example. This is something that happened in a season that had nothing to do with. Jesus walking into town on Rosh Hashanah on the Jewish New Year, as outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. And uh, the people giving him an apple so he can apple into honey. Okay. So I want to say my appreciation for the chosen is a, that's a Jewish practice that they incorporated, well-intentioned. But if I was, if I would have been the advisor back then, I would have said that that custom of taking an apple and dipping in honey to represent that everyone should have a good and sweet new year did not exist at the time of Jesus. <laughs> okay. It is an 18th century custom. Ah, okay. So, so, and in fact, even dipping things into, uh, you know, different fruits being eaten for the understanding of what the holiday is about through a meal, uh, that is not actually being done in Jesus' time in the geographic location of Israel. It was being done in Babylon, in the Jewish community there. So I think it was our important, our role to be saying, we appreciate the intention because it's the most Jewish Jesus ever depicted on the silver screen. 
uh, and therefore gratitude should be given to that. But at the same time, we want to make sure that you should know as our advice that that particular practice, if I was advisor back then, yeah. that didn't exist. You have to make a decision for theatrical purposes, whatever you want to do, if you want to still have that in the script or not. So I'm, I'm talking about something that's in the past. So that was, we felt that that was our thing, certain blessings that take place uh, that uh, that's in, in the script, uh, because you don't see, remember the chosen is there to set up the punchline from the gospels. So I can give you an example. I can tell you the biggest thing. So I was on season, season four's scripts. So when Rima was killed by a Roman and people knew that I was the Jewish advisor to the, to the chosen, they all called me up and said, why did you tell me that Rima was going to be killed by the Romans? I said, first of all, I signed an NDA. Second of all, that story never existed in the gospels. It's, it's a, it's a reason why uh, Thomas is doubting. It's a, it's a, it's a theatrical piece. It's great. But we shouldn't mourn over something that never happened. Okay, so let's just take a chill pill for a second. <laughs> uh, and that, so that's you know, so that's uh, so part of what we were doing is really advising on what to, what what was taking place in Second Temple Judaism, and and then they and it's again, it's advice. They take it or they leave it. Fascinating. Well, we have run out of time. I could go on for a long time about this. I am fascinated with what I'll call the enigma with which you live as a way of trying to build bridges. And I can't say how enough, how much I appreciate the aspect of you wanting Christians to understand the roots of their faith in the way that you do. That, that's remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the compliment. Folks, thank you again for joining us on another episode of Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. We hope to see you next time.